it's really wonderful to be here today. I was inspired by um, a topic that I actually recorded a seminar for for the Society for Epidemiologic Meeting, Society for Epidemiologic Research meeting that's coming up, thinking about what we can learn from our response to COVID-19. I'm not an infectious disease epidemiologist, but like many of you, when we've had such a defining health condition of our time, I have been drawn into this work and also an observant of our response. The argument that I'm going to make today, I'm actually going to make two arguments that I'm going to argue are related. One, throughout the pandemic, I've seen a reliance on conditional statistics and kind of an elevation of statistical statistics. And conditional statistics is basically when you are controlling for things or restricting for things or using stratification. And I think often we are drawn to these. They seem clean and universal, but sometimes they do have limitations and inference. And I'll give three quick examples. Another argument that I'm going to make is that workforce homogeneity, especially in academic public health, is a barrier to effective public health response. I owe a lot of intellectual debt actually to the authors of this paper from the early 2000s, um, Miguel Hernan, Sonia Hernandez Diaz, and Jamie Robbins, who laid out kind of a structural approach to selection bias in a way that was accessible to a PhD epi student as I was during this time period. And this paper is very specific in thinking about bias. Um, and a specific type of bias is structurally defined by direct acyclic graphs, but it had a more profound effect on me to really say that it's important that we as quantitative scientists think about our adjustments and our restrictions and the ways that we manipulate data. Because I think there can be a tendency to think that the more you're doing, the more you're gonna get and the better your estimates are gonna be. And I think this paper was kind of a, profound aha moment for me to question that. And so now I always think a lot about the adjustments I make, the restrictions, the conditioning, and what it means. So the first example I'll give in thinking about conditional statistics and how sometimes they can mislead us is in thinking about vaccination prioritization. And the argument that I make is that addition to, in addition to biological susceptibility, infection risk matters. So the slide I'm showing, I think, is one of the most profound and beautiful graphics um, that I have seen all year. And it is a, a, a meta-analysis bringing together statistics from many different surveys around the world that we're trying to calculate age-specific infection fatality rates for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, one important thing to notice is that the red is for SARS-CoV-2, the novel coronavirus. The blue is a standard seasonal flu. And this is very nice because you can make a direct comparison to something that is a little bit more familiar that you can hook into. Another thing that is very important to notice is the y-axis. This is a log base 10 scale. And when you really take that in, this is really profound and speaks to the profoundly higher risk of infection-related mortality for people who are older versus younger. So if you look at somebody who is in this 80 range, even compared to this you know, 70 range or 60 range, we're talking about an order of magnitude of difference in the infection fatality rate. And this is a profound insight that's been consistent across many settings. And I think when you see something like this, it, it is really miraculous. I think this is the reason we get into science, to find deep, profound insights about processes related to health. And this is one of the most consistent and profound insights that we have about SARS-CoV-2. And the magnitude, again, of the age effect is so overwhelming and compelling that when a lot of people started thinking about vaccine prioritization, they really thought this needs to be purely age-based. So now I'm showing a much less beautiful graphic and it's very small and I apologize for this. This is something I actually drew by hand um, at home towards the end of last year for um, an essay in an online newsletter run by Zeynep Tufekci, who is um, a professor and public intellectual here at UNC who has an online newsletter called The Insight. And she had really argued for age-based 
vaccination prioritization. And she knew that I actually disagreed a little bit on that and asked me to write a guest post. And so, you know, I took a peanut butter jar and like my kids crayons and I made these circles. I had in my head the idea of a Venn diagram because I really wanted to separate out the fact that this bottom circle kind of represents that infection fatality ratio, that biological susceptibility. If you are exposed, if you are infected, what is your likelihood of getting very sick or dying? So that's kind of down at the bottom and there's a little bit of a yellow square down there. And so older age, inadequate medical care, other unknown factors can really say who's at the most risk of bad outcomes if infected. But left out of IFR is actually the risk of getting infected. It's a condition statistic that is conditioned on the fact that you actually are infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So it's very important and it is generalizable across many settings, but the conditioning on infection risk in and of itself is a important consideration that we need to think, what are we missing when we've done that conditioning? What we are missing is who is exposed to the virus in the first place and under what conditions. So the idea of who's exposed in the first place is this left circle. And I used as a jumping off point, a controversy about prioritization within medical systems. Uh, because at Stanford, a lot of the residents who were doing the on the ground day-to-day -day work in the ICUs, in the emergency departments, actually through an algorithm at Stanford were put last. And there's really interesting things about how that algorithm came up and it's an interesting missing data problem and how you deal with missing data. But you know they had a system that had age as a factor and some other things as a factor. And so they said, why is there a 68 year old you know, radiologist who's been working from home the whole time who's getting prioritized ahead of me, a 29 year old medical resident working day in and day out in this emergency department? Yes, I know that the theoretically the risk to me is lower if we are both infected, but my probability of exposure is 100% every day I am coming into contact with this virus. Whereas this other person, although he or she may have a higher biological susceptibility, does have the means and resources to really protect themselves from exposure. And in that context, what is the fair thing? What is the just thing? And then, you know, that's represented by kind of the 29 year old medical resident here in the purple and the hospital executive who can work from home at the bottom. I thought a lot about also the intersection of likelihood of infection if you're exposed, because even this 29 year old medical resident who has extremely high levels of exposure uh, has a pretty low risk of infection because of protective, personal protective equipment, ventilation in hospitals, and what we've learned about preventing infection. But there's a whole other class of people who have a high risk of exposure, who don't have the protections from being infected, and who might also be high risk. So I use an example of a 73-year-old who's incarcerated in jail or prison in the US. I use the example of an older person who might live with a 19-year-old food service worker who does not have adequate PPE at work and who comes home to crowded working conditions where it is very hard to um, prevent transfer of infection, especially in that pre-symptomatic period where you don't know you're infected. I talked about people in nursing homes in high areas of community spread because these are settings in which there is lots of exposure because of the setting and limited protections. And so I would argue that if you just look at the IFR and think about the biological susceptibility for age, you actually miss the highest risk group who have all of these exposures um, to both exposure, infection risk, and biological susceptibility. I also said that considering these people here who have a high risk of infection, but maybe not or so biologically susceptible to bad outcomes is important too. When we think about the grandmother who lives with a 19-year-old food service worker, we might also think about the 19-year-old food service worker and how many contacts they have and how they are connected to the community. When we started talking about vaccine prioritization, it was very unclear how much the vaccines actually prevented infection and transmission. Now we know much more that they are also, especially the mRNA vaccines, powerful tools for the prevention of infection and transmission. So a lot of people have done work on this and it really shows up in the age stratified mortality, which varies tremendously by race, ethnic group. Um, 
uh, Mary Bassett and others have done work that shows the median age of mortality for Blacks and Latinos is much younger than that for whites in the US. Some of that is the underlying demographic structure of those populations, but some of it is also the heavy levels of exposure that um, working age people have. So this is a graph from Vox.com, and it really just talks about the share of the population who have died of COVID versus their population representativeness in the population. So you'll see that 21% of Americans, 35 to 44, are Hispanic, but they represent nearly half of the people in that age range who have died from COVID. And this is a little bit far afield. And I've talked some about, you know, not wanting to over condition and leave out important things like infection risk when you're doing something like an infection fatality ratio. But sometimes, of course, like conditioning really helps you have critical insights. So here's a crude death rate, and we see that Black Americans have had the highest rate of death um, of COVID, and this was in 2020, early in the epidemic, and the rates for whites and Latinos seem very similar. But the Latino population is a much younger population than the white population in the U.S., so when you age standardize, you see the profound burden of death among Hispanics and Latinos who are young. And this is just another slide to highlight the really profound surveillance work that a lot of independent organizations are doing. So this is the color of coronavirus network. And because a lot of this data is not readily available and collected, there are many entities who have independently from independent research labs or universities done work to try to even give basic statistics. And, you know, I really owe them a, a debt. So you know, I made my original argument back in December, and I said that an age-based strategy really will miss some of the people at the highest risk. And there will be dissertations written about this for decades, but we often see maps like this now. This is just one example from the University of Texas modeling Austin and different communities in Austin and mapping who's been most affected, had the most infections and who had the most vaccine coverage. And over and over again, we see that communities that had the most infections have the least vaccine coverage. Um, and I think that there are many things that go into that, but I think an over-reliance on this idea that age is the determining factor with who and who most is who is most affected um, without an insight into exposure risk and infection risk and the fact that that doesn't always play out in the same way in a lot of marginalized communities has been an oversight that has contributed to the really unjust and backwards um, pattern of vaccine coverage that we have right now. Um, this is just some data from the CDC. One thought in thinking about vaccination prioritization is that the hard hit communities might actually be less vulnerable going forward as far as future infection and mortality risk, because they've already built up a lot of pre-existing immunity from having had a high rate of um, previous infections. Um, and I would say that I think that's been overstated. Time will tell, but this is a close up of data from this year, kind of March through April. I would ignore everything in gray because the data is incomplete. And if you look at still who is dying most of SARS-CoV-2, it's the same people who've been dying the most before. Black population is at the top and then there's white um, and Hispanic. And as we've seen before, these raw counts don't account for the um, really high rates of mortality given the age structure of Hispanics in the US. And you see something similar with cases where you see that the Hispanic population is still having the highest burden of infections, despite having been one of the populations that has had the highest rates of infection previously. So my point here about vaccination prioritization and a focus on age because of the profound insight of the infection fatality ratio, which of course has to play into any system, I think that sometimes people get seduced by these things because that tells you who is theoretically at the highest biological risk, which is a different question than those at actually the highest risk. And I think that it's important for us as a field to be able to scale out and say, yes, 
this conditional statistic is telling us something about who is theoretically most at risk, but we also have to look at the surveillance facts on the ground about who's actually experiencing the most risk. My second example is one that might be familiar to you um, because a lot of this work has been led by colleagues at Harvard. Um, it's about the CDC's initial weighting of COVID-19 mortality statistics by area mortality statistics. So this is actually an interesting issue because when SARS-CoV-2 entered the United States, it didn't enter the whole country at the same time. You know, there were initial introductions, often from international travelers. Interestingly, some of the initial introductions didn't result in community spread, but eventually there was community spread. It was very undetected early in the epidemic. And um, it did make sense to think about what areas have community spread and which don't, and that those systematically differ across many variables, and you might want to take that into account. And so um, a group um, led by um, graduate students at Harvard, and also um, I have colleagues at UNC who came to me early last spring, Lauren Zala is a graduate student here and she was working with some other faculty and she said, you know, I noticed this weird footnote in the CDC data where they are um, like saying they're like adjusting for the area level of um, SARS-CoV-2 cases. And that seems like it's gonna have weird effects on their disparities counts. And they reached out to me and kind of built a team. And, you know, we agreed that this could really lead to underestimating um, the disparities in SARS-CoV-2 infection and in COVID-19 mortality risk. And in parallel, there was a group at Harvard who had had the same um, kind of observation. And in that work um, from the Harvard group, they have these beautiful you know, figures to really talk about reweighting. But I think the insight I wanna do here is that, again, when you condition on something, you are making a strong assumption about something that you want to ignore. So if I say that in the state of Iowa, there is one county that's really a hot spot, and I notice that it has a chicken uh, manufacturing and processing plant, and there's a huge outbreak there, and there's a mostly immigrant Hispanic Latino workforce there, and I say, well, let me control for the fact that this county has so much COVID when I do the statistics, um, I'm going to downweight all those Hispanic workers who live in that county. But what that's also saying is I am saying that the fact that the hotspot of cases is occurring in this heavily Latino county with this chicken processing plant is a nuisance factor that I want to adjust away. And as a social epidemiologist, I would say that's not true. I would say it is not an accident that the cases have really become concentrated in this population in this county where there are these manufacturing facilities that are not properly having work conditions to prevent infection risk, that that is actually a huge part of the story that we want to map when we think about the burden of mortality. And to say we want to control for the fact that some places have more SARS-CoV-2 than others, I understand that it's intuitive and in some ways it is really important, but it does also adjust away and suppress the structural factors that lead to the racial, ethnic, and geographic, and occupational segregation of this disease. And so in the second example, and I really encourage you to read the papers by the groups I had there, adjusting for the hard hit areas also has the effect of obscuring structural drivers of geographic inequities. So it's something to really consider. The last example I'll talk about is a little bit different. The first two examples were really about conditioning. Infection fatality ratio conditions on infection. Uh, waiting for geographic um, concentration of mortality is conditioning on you know, concentration of mortality rates. With seroprevalence, um, I think it's a little bit of a different issue, but I'm gonna call it related uh, because I think that when you decide what population am I gonna use to generalize about the seroprevalence of SARS-CoV-2, you're also making 
a decision about conditioning, about restricting on one population to make inference to a larger population. And as epidemiologists, we know that sampling matters, but throughout the pandemic, um, there has been a group of people and a group of arguments that's really ignored that. So many people have written about this. Um, this is just one lay article about some of the really pernicious um, inferences that have come from badly conducted antibody surveys. I'm gonna especially highlight the case of South Asia, um, which I don't like to talk about because it makes me too angry. And people who have argued that this population had reached herd immunity. And I have so many colleagues who have relatives in that part of the world who are trying to convince them to get vaccinated early in the year. And those people said, no, it's over. We've reached herd immunity. Everybody's already had it. And they really believe this. And this has led to really massive and profound effects. And it shows how serious our work is. There have been people who have done really high quality seroprevalence surveys. So I just wanna highlight this work from the Lancet Global Health that estimated um, seroprevalence of about 7% in India in the fall of 2020. So I think there have been people who've been doing high quality surveillance work and they are to be applauded, but there are other voices that have done low quality work and it's really criminal. And so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about work I've done and this is a little bit lower stakes. So I've done some seroprevalence work in North Carolina and I just wanna talk about sampling matters. And I think that sampling seems straightforward but it's not really straightforward because we have to decide on a sampling frame. And then once we get the sampling frame, we have to decide what factors to weight to account for non-response. And so the project that I'm gonna share with you is actually a seroprevalence study among people who are seeking antenatal care for pregnancy. And it's kind of hard to remember, but back in the spring of 2020, this was a very radical idea because people's early assumption was that older people were more likely to be infected. Those were the people we were seeing in the hospitals. Those were the people who were dying. And so it really was this idea that this was an infection of older people. And again, it was people looking at a conditioned sample. If you just look at who's hospitalized, you're gonna think this is a disease where only older people are infected. And I put this figure of a lamp here because I think you know there's the joke about somebody who's looking for their keys on the ground and you know under the street light and a friend comes up and says, you know, what are you doing? And the person says, I'm looking for my keys, I can't find them. And the person says, well, your keys aren't there. Why are you still looking under this street light? And the person says, well, this is where the light is, you know? And so sometimes we can get distracted and look where the data are available and convenient, even if that is not actually the data that we need to see. And so we knew early on from high quality surveillance studies in other countries that young adults were getting infected. They might not be showing up in the hospitals, but they were getting infected. And also young adults have many social contacts. And you know, I and my colleagues really had a hypothesis that young adults were really a key part of the network of the spread of SARS-CoV-2 in the US, especially because so many of them are working age and have jobs that require them to be physically present at work. And we were also really inspired by um, groundbreaking work from low and middle income countries who have done a lot of really great work in SARS-CoV-2 and who, you know, through the HIV epidemic, use their resources to use antenatal samples for sentinel surveillance in those populations. So we said, we think this could actually be a really good way to understand seroprevalence in North Carolina um, because it's a reproductive age population. Uh, we have really ethnically, racially, and socioeconomically diverse study participants. Often when you're doing a survey, you get the people who are the most advantaged and actually the least likely to be at risk sometimes. If you're doing a cohort study trying to draw from the population, your non-response is gonna be systematic and related to actual infection risk. But people seeking antenatal care, you're over sampling for um, Latino populations, a lot of non-white populations and low-income populations. 
um, you're going to pick up a lot of people who might even be asymptomatic, um, as opposed to a hospital based cohort or some other kind of sampling frame. And, you know, we thought there's limited evidence of differential susceptibility. People were worried that those who are pregnant might be totally different in the way they get infected and express that. We didn't see a lot of evidence for that. In addition, because we were using samples from the first prenatal visit, so some of the infections may have occurred before people were pregnant or knew they were pregnant, we thought this is something to consider, but we didn't think it was a huge bias. And so again, you know, people said there's possible immune differences, an asymptomatic population might be harder to detect their seroprevalence, um, it's only people who can get pregnant, um, potentially it's a risk averse population, especially if um, their infection happens near the time of pregnancy. And, um, you know, there still wasn't a lot known about the transmission patterns at this point. So we wrote about this a little bit in an article in BMJ Global Health. So I'm going to show you data from just 2020, June to January 2021. This is before wide scale access to vaccination in this population. Um, so this really represents infections. And I'm going to really focus on the samples, the 929 samples that were for rubella and syphilis. So this is that first panel that's run um, for the first prenatal visit. Another thing is that a lot of prenatal care was disrupted last year, but um, even though a lot of things moved to telemedicine, uh, these essential um, visits still remained. People still were recommending the professional societies, you know, to get the rubella and syphilis test, to get the gestational diabetes test. So there were a few points where people were still almost uniformly getting this care. And this was within the UNC healthcare system for people who know our area. So one of the most profound things we saw was a profound difference by race and ethnicity. Um, the proportion of ELISA tests that were seropositive was just profoundly higher for the Hispanic and Latino population here in yellow. Um, in our population, the black and white prevalence was similar. I think this also goes to kind of how mm, transmission dynamics are local. I think that could make sense in our population. I think if I looked in Charlotte, I might see something very different, a different region of the state. Um, but here, one thing we see is increasing seroprevalence over time from the summer to December, January, and just continuously a much higher seroprevalence among our Hispanic and Latino population, which in this area is a heavily immigrant population. So this is adjusted for um, some of the test characteristics. We are using ELISAs and they have very good accuracy, but they still are not perfect and so are influenced by um, the um, level of seroprevalence in the different populations. So the circles are adjusted estimates. So one thing that I think is really interesting is that seroprevalence was rising over time and it was still rising over time in the Latinx population. So you see kind of a big jump um, in late summer, which corresponds to kind of a surge that we saw across the South in um, transmission in the summer in the US last year. Things were pretty stable across populations in the early fall. And then another big jump around the holiday period, which maps on to the trends we saw. But one thing I was really interested in is what would happen in this December, January timeframe for the Latinx population. Going back to this idea of, um, seroprevalence and people who've said, well, if you have populations who've had a lot of infection, you're going to see a slowdown in transmission risk. And of course, that's true, but I think that has been overstated. So we have a population here where, you know, there was more than 30% of people who'd already had infections. So following that logic, maybe we'd see less of an additional jump in infection risk for this population than other populations. And that is not what we saw. Instead, we saw a 10 percentage point jump between the late fall and the holidays um, on par or greater than the increases we saw in the other populations, despite this population being a population that had already been heavily impacted and with a huge burden of previous infection, they were still so susceptible. And they were still so susceptible for the same reasons they were susceptible in the first place, because of their exposures and occupational and housing conditions.
So I think when you're thinking about seroprevalence, like sampling matters. I think inferring infection rates from hospital restricted data or convenience samples can be misleading. And we must always be rigorous and have a theoretical underpinning for how we sample and the biases that may come from different sampling frames. So kind of started off by talking about a few conditional statistics um, and you know analyses that may seem clean but could be misleading. And a lot of my point here is that I think sometimes there is an idea that we want to control away the messy social forces that shape risk and get down to kind of a consistent biological phenomenon that really does generalize across populations. And I think that's important as well. A lot of my work has actually been about arguing that a lot of the racial ethnic differences we see are not because of differences fundamentally in the biology of people, um, that most biological processes actually are pretty stable across populations, but the exposures and the patterning of risks and uh, prevention really varies. And that's the most important thing. But those things are complicated and messy and context specific. And I think there is an allure of trying to control them away. But when we control them away, I think sometimes that makes us miss the forest for the trees. Another thing I want to talk about is workforce homogeneity. I think that COVID-19 has shown that that's a profound barrier to an effective public health response. I started thinking about that with kind of the hashtag of stay at home. I remember when a lot of colleagues were posting, you know, stay at home, which makes so much sense. If you have a disease that's spread by close contact and social mixing, it makes all the sense in the world to tell people to stay at home. This is not a wrong message, but it's a profoundly incomplete message. I come from a large Black Southern family, and my dad has eight brothers and sisters, and my mom has five brothers and sisters, four now. And um, when I think about my aunts and uncles and my cousins, almost none of them had work from home jobs. Um, they are um, in food service, they're flight attendants, and there were still flights going off. They were you know, teachers who were working in the classroom doing their remote education. They were people who work um, as in hospitals and grocery stores, they were, they were working in retail, like they were doing jobs where you have to keep showing up. And so when they would ask me for advice, stay at home was completely just inadequate to what they needed. They needed actual advice that applied to their real lives about what they could do to mitigate risk. And if I had said to them, oh, just stay at home, that would have been so profoundly um, irrelevant to them. And also kind of like a let them eat cake thing. Oh, just stay at home. And I know this is not the way it was intended, but I think that um, it took a while for a lot of people to realize how incomplete a message this is, especially for the highest risk group. And I think it has the potential to come off to make us as a field seem callous and totally out of touch and irrelevant if we don't have enough community ties to know that this advice of stay at home is extremely limited for a lot of people who are at highest risk. So I wanna tell two stories. So I have one story about a cousin of mine who lives in the South, who's an assistant manager at a fast casual restaurant. You know, he's single, he lives alone, he doesn't have health insurance. Um, and so sometimes he would call me and he would be like, my boss just came in and he was like, had just gone to a party with his in-laws and one of his in-laws, you know, had just tested positive from COVID. And he's just like in the office with me, like nothing's wrong. And my cousin's like, what should I do? And, you know, I talked to him like, were they providing you good quality masks? He's not, not, he's like, not really. And so I'm like, okay, we have to get you good masks and you just have to kind of do the best you can. Um, testing access was really limited and even though tests should be free, they're actually were really hard to get. And I actually thought like, is there a way that I could financially support my cousin so he can quit this job, you know, for a year? And that wasn't possible, but to tell him stay at home was profoundly inadequate. And also he's like 
a young man who's like in these years where social connections really matter and he would want to see other people even in his leisure time and so we talked about meeting up with people outside and other ways to try to see people in a low risk way and that was really important um i have another cousin who's often on my mind when i think about vaccination and vaccine hesitancy this is a cousin of mine who's very smart and very opinionated and who's one of the few people in our extended family who says that she's not getting vaccinated. And so I hope that changes. But when I talked to her about it, it was interesting what her responses were. So one, she does have a history of bad allergies. And at the beginning, there was more of talk about people having bad allergic reactions. I think that that's been clarified in the time since. Um, she kind of talked about not liking being told what to do which is her personality and something to consider when we talk to people. But another thing she talked about and that I knew about was that she'd already had COVID. So she also feels like she's at lower risk, which is somewhat true, but the way she got COVID was at her job. So she works um, at a call center doing customer service for a hospital in the Midwest. And you know she sits in a room with somebody else and they talk all day on the phone, which we know from early case studies is a disaster. Some of the earliest studies we saw were people who were working in call centers. We know that, you know, the kind of talking and vocalizing spreads, um, you know, viral spread. And so she asked her boss if she could do her job from home. She's on the phone all day. This is a job that could be done from home. And the boss said no. And she reached out to HR. HR says there's no reason you can't do it from home, but she was refused. So she kept coming in. And she got COVID and her office mate got COVID and she had spread it to her whole family. And then when her health system says, okay, we have a vaccine, come take it. Like, is she gonna trust them? She knows they don't care about her best interests. And so when I think about vaccination, like I wouldn't wanna take a vaccine from the employer who got me infected either. And so I think when I think about vaccination, I think about really listening to people. And I think about also providing other settings that, because there are settings that might seem fine to most people. You might think, oh, hospitals, they're fine. I have a good association with hospitals. But for many reasons, a lot of people don't, including the ways that hospital systems that give lip service to promoting health actually sometimes treat their workers really badly. And so I think what to do with all of this. So I've said a response of just stay at home, which might theoretically be the best response is often inadequate. So I think there are many different responses. I think one set of responses is something that I've been doing and that a lot of my colleagues have been doing, um, which is kind of direct um, community action. I think honestly, almost all of your black, Latinx, Pacific Islander, native populations have been using their nights and weekends to talk to their families and communities about COVID-19. You can just take that as an assumption. Um, another set of responses from allies has to do with harm reduction. I think, you know, somebody like Julia Marcus has really been at the forefront of this to acknowledge that not everybody can stay at home, that people have different social needs, and to give people tools to be able to reduce risk. Another thing is policy advocacy. There are some people who say, I don't wanna focus on harm reduction. I wanna focus on the fact that it's not right that people have to work and live in these conditions. And I think, you know, you have people um, like Justin Feldman and Seth Prince and Abigail Cardis who really pushed hard on just objecting to the policy framework that puts people at this much risk. And, you know, I've been part of the COVID-19 Health Justice Advisory Committee um, with Mary Bassett and Zinzi Bailey and Chandra Ford and Natalia Linos and Sherelle Barber. And we've also kind of taken policy stands. So in some ways, this might seem like an unorthodox epi talk, but I think there's a common thread for the first three sets of examples. I think that sometimes our draw towards wading away geographic differences or focusing on biological susceptibility or drawing conclusions about seroprevalence from limited samples is grounded in and advances biological determinism that's divorced from the social processes that produce unequal SARS-CoV-2 infection risk. And this applies to a lot of other health conditions. I think that workforce homogeneity is a barrier to an effective public health response. I think a research community can't be nimble and responsive when it's blind to the living and working conditions of 
um, a large part of its population. I also think about people like Emily Smith, who's part of like a white evangelical community who's been trying to minister there and it's, it's hard, but you have to have people who are in these communities to know what's important and to have legitimacy to speak to them. Um, these are some of my collaborators and funding for the Zero Prevalence Project. I'm really lucky to have met many people across campus I had never met before this year, um, and I'm really grateful to them. And that's it. Thank you.